We are delighted to welcome Bob Mosher as our keynote speaker today. Bob has been working in the learning and training industry for over 30 years, winning two lifetime awards and pioneering new approaches to learning. Bob is the founder of Applied Synergy and a practitioner in the five moments of need design methodology. Over to you, Bob. Linda, thank you so much. I want to check, are you hearing me, my friend? Audio coming through okay? Can you give me in chat, friends, if you're hearing me okay? Brilliant. Welcome. Uh, as you can see, <laughs> uh, I'm coming to you from Rochester, New York in the United States, um, and I am actually in my brother-in-law's uh, bedroom office, as you can see from behind me. And friends, I, I think this is a remarkable thing to speak to what we're going to talk about today. Um, how wonderful is this? Uh, if you think about it, really, and, and, and also how can this not change the landscape of learning? That we can have this kind of a moment together in coming from literally a, a bedroom in a home in, in a place called Rochester, New York, in upstate New York, to, to the rest of you across the world. How do we not, how does this not forever change um, coming out of the pandemic, how we look at instruction? So today, friends, what I'm going to do, do a little technology change here, if you don't mind. Look at my title, Examining the Post-COVID Hybrid Model, uh, VILT, Virtual Instructional Led Training, but notice in parentheses, I have ILT, highlighted and underlined version 2.0 because I, I don't see how this new blend and we talk about blended learning in our industry forever i don't know how this new blend does not affect every element of of face to face if you will like we're doing today instruction both vilt and ilt and i'm going to talk a little about that today so let me give, give you a little bit about the background of where i'm coming from i have had the good fortune in the last 14 months, although as horrific as the pandemic clearly has been on a personal and for many professional level, um, I think in many ways it has been a, um, if, I, if I dare use the word, remarkable time for learning and development. We have been, I, in my 38 years, I've been at this 38 years, friends, some of, longer than some of you probably been alive on this particular uh, webinar. Um, I, I've never seen uh, L&D have to step up like we, like we have in the last year and a half. I don't know if you're feeling the same thing in your world. But, I, but in all my talks, and I've had, the, had the, the, the great fortune of talking to thousands of you throughout the pandemic across the globe, a lot of it about this shift to VILT, but more importantly, the shift of the, of the landscape of learning. And so I'm going to do in the next uh, half hour or so, or 25 minutes or so, is share um, the, the feedback from all of those meetings, the, the research that's been gathered. And I would love to hear your feedback on that. So by all means, in chat, let me know. When we move to our panel, by all means, let's make this an engaging conversation as we go deeper into this. Um, and find out a bit more. Um, so here's where we're going to go for our agenda, friends. So what have we learned? I want to get, get a little feedback from you in a moment. going to do a poll. Hopefully, many of you were able to do the poll when we started. Um, I'm also going to ask you a, a, a couple questions about how it's going, and I want you to use chat for that. Then I'm going to actually approach the new hybrid from three areas that I think we as um, learning professionals need to look at. Obviously, technology is an important part of this. It's, it, I, think it's been what, I think it has been what has led this movement um, and so we'll talk a bit about that. New methodologies. This is important too, friends, because frankly, technology is a hammer. Methodology is carpentry, if I may use the metaphor, right? So the carpentry of our art of learning and development is not any technology we use. That is a hammer to the nail, friends. Um, so to make this work, we have seen some remarkable shifts in methodology through technology that I'd like to talk about today in this new, again, hybrid or blend. And find number three, our learners. Let's talk about them for a bit. I don't think we talk to them enough, if I may show my bias. Um, and I think we have to do it in the coming out of this. We have to do some uh, learner analysis, if I may use that term, to find out really how they are doing. Um, uh, personally, obviously, that's been a big part of this whole thing, but instructionally or from a learning perspective, what, how do they see and perceive learning going forward? And I think we need to talk to them too. We'll share a couple um, bullets from that as well. So here we go. And if I may, my friends, I'd like some, to put a poll up. Uh, if you look over into chat, how do you, how has your VILT gone so far? Give yourself an array rating of one to five of how you, and let's be, let's be honest here, we're among friends, right? Um, let's look back on this last year and a half and, and see how is your VILT, in, look at this, impacting the daily performance of your learners. Not just whether or not you've got it up and going. That's not the question. The question is, like any learning event, how is your VILT impacting the performance of your learners through using this shift to VILT? So not at all, right? I mean, it's just, we just haven't crossed that barrier yet, all the way up to uh, directly and completely. Could you um, vote on that for me? 
Good, good. So, so we, we've moved the dial, right? We moved the dial. Let's do this. Let's go back to chat if you wouldn't mind. Let's answer my next question, which is, what have you learned about VLT in the last several months? Could you give me in chat real quick? What, what's your what, what's your number one learning about this move to VLT and many organizations entirely because of not being able to go into the office? Could you give me in chat what your learnings have been so far? And then I'll, then I'll share some general. Um, observations we found across uh, all the folks we've spoken to. So in chat, what have you learned about VLT in the last several months? Good, bad, and indifferent. Shorter lessons, Laura, love that. What else have we learned about through our experience with VLT? Again, it can be things that were not great that we learned. <laughs> Anything else? Attendees like the short sessions. And look at that, flexibility. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, big time, yep. Zoom fatigue, yeah, look at you. <laughs> We're gonna talk about that too. That's where I think the blend has to come in, right? Obviously because of the nature of the pandemic, we shifted significantly, but I get we have to kind of shift back. Manager leader support is crucial. Love that, Nikki. Yeah, lots of breaks. <laughs> Needs to be concise. Look at you. Moving existing in-person content online does not engage. Look at you, Nessa, thank you. Yeah, camera is an issue. It does uh, live, really helps with engagement. Breakout rooms, spectacular, Pauline, love that. They're loving the breakout rooms. Different types in prep and design is needed. Takes more time. Some elements are better virtual and will stay that way. I love that, Sheila, good. Plus the line in the last, we can't hear you. <laughs> uh, you're on mute, how's that? I, I'm gonna make a t-shirt that we print out that we put across the world, this uh, you're on mute. A lot of learners don't like and can't turn on audio and visual. There's an intimacy to this. We're gonna talk about it in a minute. Need to continue. Good, 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 good. Yeah, love it. So if you look back at my slides, here's sort of the general consensus across all of those we spoke to, all right? A lot of it's logistics, right? We can reach a wider, wider audience. Obviously the economics of no travel is remarkable. I love what you, someone said earlier about the flexibility. We're finding it to be much more flexible in speed to delivery and our ability to react to things. We've been chasing agile design forever, friends, right? Um, mentor sessions are great online. Love that, Laura. We're gonna talk about that in a minute too, right? And that smaller time requirements, people are liking. So that means we can, we've talked about chunking as an instructional design methodology forever. We're able to chunk in a more remarkable way. And look at number four, spaced learning. I'm gonna talk about that in a minute. I would argue in the residential model, the ILT, friends, we over teach. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that. But when we get people in a room for three days, five days, a week, two weeks, we cover a lot in that amount of time. And space learning is one of the more proven theories in learning that virtual instruction and the blend of it's remarkable about. But there's also the human side. Look at the next four things. A lot of people are finding it more highly personal of a learning engagement, even though we're not in the same place. The seeing each other, you guys in the classroom, you see backs of heads frankly, depending on how you set the room up, everyone stares at the instructor. In this world, we're seeing each other. We're seeing the, you're in this, you're in my brother-in-law's bedroom, office bedroom right now, right? We're seeing different parts of people's world that is making it more intimate, more consistent learning experience because I'll talk about that in a minute because a lot of people are bringing video into this world from the instructional side. We'll talk about that in a moment in the blend. Um, customized learning environments, meaning we can bring people into very specific smaller groups because the economic model of classrooms and these kinds of things is, is, is not the same. And lastly, look at this, great, greater blending of broader learning experiences. We are using more, as you'll see in a moment, technologies and therefore resources in instruction than instructors ever brought into the classroom. I'll say that again. We are using greater blend of resources in instruction, not just in the VILT portion, there's a hint, than we've ever done before in some very, very, very powerful ways. Guest speakers is one of my favorites, right? We couldn't bring the CEO often into a room uh, in, in building nine, because the CEO may be in another city. But in VILT, we can bring experts in, for instance, who are sitting at their offices or sitting at home or wherever in the world they are for a five minute, 10 minute talk. When have we ever been able to do that before? So some really powerful things are coming out of this. So let's get into this friends by discipline. So here's the blend of three areas that are a part of this new hybrid model. 
I'm going to start with the obvious, and of course, that's technology. And if I may, although I hate acronyms, I'm going to invent a new one so I can use it throughout the presentation. <laughs> but virtual hosting platform, Zoom, GoToMeeting, uh, Teams, all these things, friends, are that's where, where we're kind of going with this. And that is I'm going to call VHP, virtual hosting platforms. And here's a neat thing that's emerging. What we're finding with many of them, friends, is that they weren't all designed for instruction. Would you agree? I don't think Zoom, when it, came, when it thought of Zoom, was thinking of it as an instructional tool or Teams as an instructional tool for Microsoft or GoToMeeting, right? Listen to the name, GoToMeeting, right? So what we're finding is these remarkable new peripheral tools are emerging and probably leading the charge are these virtual whiteboard environments. I don't know if you've tried these before. Um, but they are really changing the nature of instruction and the power of breakout rooms. Guys, a lot of you mentioned breakout rooms earlier. These virtual whiteboard add-ons are, are creating remarkable um, times to collaborate. And listen to this, not just during instruction. We're leaving these whiteboards open, these polls open, these virtual campuses open, so that people can have, listen to this, a continuous learning experience. Mural, thank you, is one of them. Um, mural, like the mural is another one. Laura, thank you. So M Miro and Miro, Mural are two very popular ones right now. And they're, and they're really stunning, right? So what we're getting at, friends, is the blend is no longer an event-based thing. It is a continuous learning thing. Think about that. Thanks to the power of this blend that's coming out of the technology. Number two, we're hosting a lot of disparate assets, meaning we are bringing in into the classroom things that we may not own, that we may not host, but that are remarkable resources. And therefore, guess what? Look at this number two, content management systems, CMSs and LCMSs, learning content management system. I don't know if you guys have ever made a foray into this. They are coming back in a big way because of number one. And number one, bullet number two, we are hosting a lot of assets and controlling them, maintaining them, versioning them, um, making them easily accessible, using them for multiple things has brought the CMS, L LCMS back into the ecosystem. We love using that word of this blend again. And then second, lastly, of course, in this area, e-learning, our LMSs have been pretty brilliant. They, they, they carried the day in some remarkable ways and they've kind of been rebirthed because of this, what's going on. But look, here's what's interesting. Two new technologies, not and one of them is actually not very new, have really come back in a big way because of the idea of spaced learning. And number one is LXPs, learning experience platforms, um, degrees of the world, right? there's, there's others, right? Um, EdCast, th these kinds of technologies. Because we're hosting so many assets and not just, here, listen to this, learning traditional training assets. Notice I didn't say learning assets, traditional training assets. But we're, we're hosting a whole different set of experiences through this technology like never before. So LXPs are starting to find their, their way. And also EPSSs. This is the one that's been around since 1991, friends. But boy, these are coming back in a huge way. Electronic performance support systems because they are the dashboard that binds. They are what keeps this whole thing all together for us. They link into two and three and four in the list and give our learners a single dashboard to have experiences not just in the classroom, be it virtual or live, but also to carry beyond that into some powerful, powerful uh, learning in the workflow on the job. And that has to do with, we are now doing a better job of focusing more on, this is my favorite thing out of all this, friends. We are doing a much better job of focusing more on workflow than taking people out of the workflow because we're coming into their homes. We're coming into their offices. We are thinking very differently about instruction and the blend of instruction because in the old model, the residential model, we took them out of that to come to us. Well, friends, we are now going to them and we're not just addressing new and more anymore. These are the five moments of need. People have to learn new stuff and have to learn more stuff. But you guys, look, they also have to apply, ch change and solve in ways we've never seen before. The pandemic has caused moments three, four, and five to be heightened, particularly change and solve in ways we've never seen before. And traditionally, the virtual hosting platforms, the gathers, and e-learning and LMS have been targeted at teaching. 
new and more. But here's the power. In the new blend, the EPSSs and the LXPs are helping us intentionally reach into apply, solve, and change. In the old days, friends, when people left my classroom, when they left that line and went into three, four, and five, I'll be honest, I sort of left them too. We didn't go with them into the workflow. With, with the breakup of virtual instruction, and we'll talk about methodology in a moment, we have been able to extend our reach in some ways that have just been remarkable. And so the CMS, LCMS, ties the whole thing together. We get a lot, we get, I get a lot of questions about what is the new ecosystem? We use that word all the time. What's the digital ecosystem of this new world and this new blend? Well, there it is on your screen in some ways. And again, by the way, this is not an exhaustive list. But these, these are what we're seeing to be the dominant players in the toolkit of VILT. And guess what? It has had a significant impact on ILT. ILT as well. I don't see the classroom friends ever being the same again because of what we just went through. And Or let me put it this way. And, and if I may, this is my opinion. I hope we don't go back to the classroom the way it was because of all we have learned in, here comes, methodology. So check this out, friends. Here's some research about um, what, was, what we struggled with as we journeyed into virtual. And see at the bottom here, the biggest challenge in converting in-person programs, which is what we all faced, right? Look at number one, by 28%, one third of the vote was, we, had, we, needed, we needed new methodology for this because as someone wrote earlier, just taking in-person classes to online is hard, didn't work. Because guess what? In-person instruction is different than online instruction, right? So methodology becomes a big deal. And, and there are new, wonderful, powerful trends in this blend emerging. Number one, space learning. I love this. I don't know if you guys know, but my background actually is what's called elementary education or primary education here in the States. We had people, in, we have students in, in school for a year, right? We were taught spaced learning as a design methodology, but guess what? When I went to corporate training, we brought people in for one day. We brought people in for three days. We brought people in for five days, two weeks. But guess what? Spaced learning, I, I didn't, it literally went out the window. I didn't see any of it. Spaced learning is, is, is spreading the gather out over time. And here's what you get. We're learning that what needs to be taught I love this, is not, here comes, everything. Do, do this for me in chat. Does anyone know what SME stands for? Yeah, subject matter experts. When we design instruction, we bring subject matter experts into our rooms. But here's the thing, friends, guess what? Wait, wait till this. We have found that subject matter experts alone don't create great classes. Why? Because they're subject matter experts. They have forgotten what it's like to not be an SME. And here's, and everything ends up landing in the classroom. The power of what's happening now, friends, is that we are learning that we don't have to put everything in when we can spread learning over time. Let me say that again. The new blend is we don't have to put everything in the classroom when we can spread it over time because we can have the things of let's use face-to-face -face or virtual for what's not just important, but what is most critical. Check out this chart. This is a new chart that's emerging in helping us design for what is in the blend, meaning what's in the gather and what's not. Notice it, it, what it pivots on, and, I, and I, the screen I'm seeing, unfortunately, friends, doesn't show the title, but it, it pivots on critical outcome. This is not important, let me say it again. Everything's important, everything is important, and everything needs to be eventually applied. But do we have to teach everything? And what's happening is this rubric you're seeing on your screen is helping us design, divide by tasks and content areas and outlines to be taught what we can actually move into the workflow and let be learned there through self-instruction and mentoring and coaching, one through fours, and what actually does need to be taught in VILT or classrooms, e-learning and coaching, is things that are critical. So again, a very significant shift, friends, in our thinking about design. The, again, one of the big blends here is that we're not putting everything in the, what I'll call in a moment, gathers. When, when we meet virtually, we are allowed to spread things out more over time. And that means things can be learned 
while doing, which by the way, is the most powerful way to learn anything. Learning while doing is the most powerful way to learn everything, anything, but arguably everything should not be learned that way. I don't want my pilots to learn through doing. <laughs> I want them to have some instruction on flying, right? So what else is going on with this? Well, we're, we're seeing an introduction of what are called expand and apply assignments, meaning we don't just because of space learning, because of smaller lessons, because of moving things over time, blending by by, by um, chunking, we are seeing expand and apply activities win the day. Meaning we're giving people things to do between sessions, friends. We're not just taking breaks. We have them expand on a small chunk of information because that's all we need to teach. Hour to two hour long sessions. That's all we're seeing. We're not seeing full day long virtual sessions, five hour long virtual sessions, right? And then we give them expand and apply assignments before they come back. I'll talk about the methodology in a moment. And, th and then look what's also coming in. Feedback. Love this. Feedback is, and it's, again, one of the more powerful teaching instructional tools we have. Guess what, guys? Doesn't come from a trainer. It comes from a instructor, yes, but a coach or mentor, a peer, or a manager. These people are in the work. So their ability to mentor and coach employees through instruction in an intentional way through the, 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 the emerging uh, practice we're seeing is, is really moving us beyond new and more and into apply, change, and solve. So let's take a quick look. Here's the flow that we're seeing in the blend. Of course, you set things up, but then you bring them in for what we're seeing to be an hour to two and a half hour long sessions. That seems to be the global average of what people can tolerate and what fits into virtual instruction. But then there's the expand, apply, and feedback part. They are given expand assignments, apply assignments, feedback from managers, coaches, instructors. Then guess what? They come back again. But notice friends in this first gather, that this can be done in live instruction. Think about this. Think about the impact on the classroom. I know this is VILT version 2.0, but what we're seeing is this is having a significant impact on live instruction because I don't think, nor should we go back to teaching everything. Why? Because we now have a methodology and a technology that lets us space learning out over powerful, powerful ways. Missing, missing assessment there on the previous slide. Yeah, we're gonna get to, assessment's gonna be big. And that's the feedback part, Pablo, right? Assessment is in the feedback. That's what I mean by feedback. People do the apply and assignment activities. They expand on those activities and then they are given feedback, they're assessed. You can even grade their work, right? A big deal, a great point. And then of course you do these, but then here's those tools, friends. Here's the new tools of the day that are emerging. The EPSS LXP, right? Are being, are significant in helping us, right? I love that. It's, it's really some remarkable things that I think Pablo have been missing from instruction for quite a long time. So lastly, engagement is very different online. We're learning that these tools do different things. Chat, polls, whiteboards, breakout rooms, friends, those are different than questioning in a classroom and small group work. How do we make these engaging in a very powerful and different ways? And here's this, here's a switch. Do they all have always have to happen during the gather, during the live event? Why can't they be after? And ramp up and down is the last thing I'll end with before the learner. This has been exciting too. What we're seeing is we are helping learners learn to learn in this model, not just learn content. I'll say it again. We are seeing helping, learnings build, helping learners build self-efficacy, helping learners build courage, helping learners build um, their, their, their ability to self-instruct and self-develop in ways that the classroom alone often did, did not. So in ramp up and down, what we're seeing across these cycles is that there's the axis of instructor, instructor help, and there's the axis of self-help. I'll say them again, the axis of instructor help, the axis of self-help. We are seeing an intentional efforts of moving people into the workflow by designing an experience that literally teaches over time, but because of expand and apply, we teach learners how to use other resources to continue their self-instruction when we're not teaching. And we're also doing it through the design of our content from highly guided in the beginning to, sorry, that's not coming across, unguided at the end, 
So friends, where I'm going with this is a new method, is, a new approach is emerging that is not pivoting only on blending content. It's pivoting on our ability to work, to reach into the workflow and blend based on our learner's ability and teaching them, helping them to support themselves. Super powerful um, way of extending our reach. So lastly, the learners, my last two minutes, then we'll, we'll go to the panel. We are finding a more courageous and self-reliant learner, friends, and we, got, and we, and we want to continue to enable that. As, as horrific as the pandemic has been, people have had to survive it. I, I, one of my friends said they went from survive to thrive in the last 14 months. And it was painful. I'm not saying it was fun or easy or intentional. But we have got a, a more courageous learner and a much more virtually literate one. Virtual literacy, as we'll call it, is through the roof right now because I'm Zooming with my 92-year-old mom, right? She never went online before. But her literacy to get into a Zoom meeting now virtually is through the roof. We have got to pivot on this. User-generated content, that's all those assets I was talking about. They have made some remarkable stuff on their own. We have to tap into that. And lastly, we said it earlier, here's the temperament of this, a lot of burnout. So the pendulum swung to virtual, I get it. The pendulum has to swing back to the blend where we use virtual intentionally and less, but we also use self-instruction and workflow learning and the tools I've talked about more to create a remarkable blend. What a fantastic presentation. Thank you very much for sharing such insightful areas that are really, really topical at the minute. And I suppose to dissect the subject even further, I'm going to invite our panelists, Pauline from Premark, John from FlexLab, and Ilsa from Learnovate to join us here on stage. So I suppose, Bob, you spoke around about as well, you know, L&D really having to step up um, like never before during this pandemic and you know that mental shift of training to performance not just being a once-off project and or organizations having to see return on investment and i know bob I've, I've heard talks before with yourself that you've really been shouting from the rooftops for many years now about this shift and the importance of it and um, you know but it, it's never been a top priority do you see um a shift now due to COVID and how Will this affect both the learner and the organizations? Yeah, I just had a conversation with friends the other day with a, with a learning leader about this, that, that they, there's been a new ask, and that is that the workflow is disrupted in ways pe we don't even understand yet, right? People, we don't, we don't, a lot of people don't even know what the new workflow is. Organizations are returning in, in, in hybrid models to the workplace, meaning some are being allowed to stay home, some are, are, are being asked to come into the building. The, the workflow is a physical thing, as much as a as a get work done thing. And so I think now more than ever, our ability to help them understand and analyze and define and reach into the workflow as we come out of this is more important than ever because of, of all that's been done. I think I think L&D can play, play a powerful role in helping understand what those are and then design solutions like we talked about today that meet them in a powerful way. Yeah, great, thanks Bob. Um, so please do, um, attendees, post your questions in the event chat and we will get to them as well. And if there's any that we don't during the event, we'll come back to you afterwards. We'll, we'll be able to share them with uh, the panelists here. So, you know, as you said, Bob, you know, COVID really has upended our lives and employees around the world, um, you know, have had to settle into the rhythm of mandatory remote working. Um, all of us in, in Learnovate as well, and sometimes with our children joining in on the calls as well. So, you know, companies now are trying to decide what's the best way forward. And Bob, you spoke about during your presentation that flexibility and the number of powerful things with the BILT. But it's clear that many employees don't want to necessarily go back to the office full time. So, Ilse, I'm going to throw this one to you. Having worked in Google, um, you know, not so long ago in the big enterprises, what opportunities do you see the pandemic has brought or will bring for hybrid work? not just for the larger organizations, but also for the small enterprises as well. Yeah, thanks, Linda. I think I think the biggest opportunity there is that COVID has given a moment to pause and to reflect. I think from my own experience, when, when the pandemic hit, um, I was working in onboarding at the time, and all of a sudden, 
we had to make the shift but also all of a sudden every the, a lot was possible a lot of the barriers a lot of the challenges that we were facing in trying to make make changes were all of a sudden they were removed and all all heads were pointing all noses were pointing in the same direction and i think yeah that's really the big opportunity going forward as well. Um, and it's also been like Bob was saying as well, that the, the pandemic and, and, and COVID has been very devastating on a lot of a lot of uh, levels, but also gives that opportunity to to pause and really move forward in a different way. Um, I think that's the opportunity in terms of the future of work or a hybrid working model is really to engage in a conversation that's organization wide, whether that's a large organization or a small organization it's really about having that conversation about okay how do we not go back to the way that we were doing things but how do we kind of keep that creative hat on and look at different ways of doing that what 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 are what do we need at an individual level and how can an organization support that i think that's where the big opportunity is and, and to to do that in a way that's much faster than than we've been able to do before Brilliant. Thanks, um, Elsa. John, Pauline, maybe you, you could come in on this particular one. How do companies continue to adjust to this change? So, you know, the remote learning, how do we continue to keep that momentum going even when we do maybe go back into the office or have that hybrid model? Um, John, do you want to go first? Yeah, like I, I, I probably agree with Bob. I, I, I think that um, I think that learning and development did step up to the place during the pandemic. We, we became much more proactive, we were faster, and I think we were much more connected with the business. Just it was, and we, we kind of got into got into workflow learning more out of necessity than design. And so I think like I think pre-pandemic, the whole thing which with, with workflow learning, it did require a bit of a mindset change because trainers are used to designing interventions and designing assets, and, and learners are used to being spoon-fed. But we had this situation during the pandemic where employees were i suppose communicating with each other and engaging with each other on platforms like like slack and microsoft teams and you know they were sharing assets with each other and they were problem solving and then i think learning and development was looking in at that on that and going oh my god this is like a really great way for us to connect with our employees without maybe asking them to log into a learning management system or or to a content management system and you know i think that that, that experience of 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 supporting them in, in on the job through platforms like that has really opened the eyes to to other opportunities in terms of how we how we design how we design learning. And I think as well, like the 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 other thing probably is that that transition from the virtual classroom, or sorry, from the from the physical classroom to the virtual classroom, like that was a, that was obviously the big transition that happened. But the, I suppose blended learning now is more about the the flow, as Bob, as Bob was talking about there. And the more we can kind of connect that flow. With the workflow that i think the more the more the more engagement and performance we're going to get yeah brilliant pauline your thoughts on that one yeah i agree with everything that has, has been said uh, i guess you know i think we need to very to focus very heavily on the learners themselves and their needs uh to provide them with more autonomy as well uh on where they work on where they learn and accelerate this digital transformation um but also you know in terms of our uh, trainers, facilitators who also need to acquire new skills in digital, you know, and may not be familiar with uh, with, with this uh, digital transformation and how do we support them and make sure that they are comfortable and making the most uh, out of these tools that are now available to them. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Pauline. And um, just see a question there from Sheila in the chat. So as we ask back and see the face-to-face continuation of virtual learning, what um, is the panel's view of a learning Mentioning some participant virtual and some face to face in the room. I think that's kind of the more challenging. Yeah, and, and I, I, I would throw a flag of caution here, if I may, uh, because that model is failing miserably in a lot of. Now, now I'm going to also be say I, it, I don't think it doesn't mean it can't work, but yeah. um, I, I think we have to be careful with that one. Honestly, schools have tried this for a long time. At least they have in the states. You know, they, they could be this horrific back and forth of some came in, some didn't, this type of deal. And so you put an instructor up in front with eight, eight kids virtual in the room, virtually in the room from home and eight kids staring at them face to face in the classroom. And teachers struggled terribly with that. Who do you speak to? Who, how do you engage? How do you listen to one and not the it, It's really I'm not again, I'm not saying it's not doable. But what I, what I will say, if I may, in my old age, is that we we struggle with with design and complex instructional models because a lot of our trainers candidly aren't professional trainers for instance they come from the business and things so i think it takes a trained trainer 
to handle that hybrid model. It, just my opinion, because I've seen it, seen it tried now. Um, again, not throwing it out, but I think we have to be awful careful with that being being the blend. Bernard, what's the best way to trigger the want to learn something that's important to the individual success without the anxiety, anxiety and some feedback some mechanisms feedback after the aftermath, the so like exam and stress. stress? Extrinsic and in intrinsic motivators has always been a challenge, right? And, and what we're talking about here is extrinsic. We want, we want learners to want to learn. But here's the thing, friends, I think we have to look at learning differently. Is learning inflicted? Is it a push or a pull? Right. And, and so I, I what I what I find is learners, when you when you understand and examine the workflow well, are highly motivated to learn in the, in the flow of work, but only if it helps them work better. Right. They, if it's if it step out of work to learn, even though I'm in, you know, right, like like if I may take any learning course, for instance, that I'm mandated to take. Of course, where's the motivation to do that? Besides, maybe I get yelled at if I don't pass the test at the end. That, 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 but what, what, what we find is if you understand the workflow well and embed resources at the point of need, that accelerate performance and you and you understand the day that they're in and the and the issues they're they're struggling with, they are highly motivated to consume. So I think it's all about again pivoting on the workflow and understanding what we what we define as learning in that workflow versus training in that workflow, which I honestly think are two different things. Yeah. I think as well we just on that I, probably as trainers as well, we meet we need to be more comfortable with the, the why question. So and and from the perspective of learners, like, you know, what's, it, what's in it for me? Um, and, you know, from their perspective, it's going to be, is this going to make my job easier? Is this going to advance my career? Is this going to help me perform more effectively? And, you know, as long as we keep the focus of the why question, when we're engaging with the business and having those performance conversations, you know, then I think the, the appetite and the motivators will come naturally from there, you know, and it's all about just keeping that, I suppose, that visibility on that question all the time. Yeah. Yeah, and just, just to build on what Baba said, you know, about the five months of need to focus uh, on, you know, applying, solving and change. Uh, we're seeing as well a huge engagement in bite-sized learning and creating content. So training that's happening, learning that is happening outside the classroom that fits more easily in a work schedule that really fills in the flow. And this just-in-time learning is, as we've seen a, a huge success uh, at Primark, you know, in this, in this kind of learning. And uh, we've been encouraged to, to do more and more in that and and not just you know from an energy perspective but uh, our subject matter expert that was mentioned as well we've seen so much engagement from that creating more content that is uh built uh by our employees for our employees had a major success and even our our learners themselves you know sharing content with all the tools they have in our in their hands and not only the ones that we've provided them with yeah brilliant and peer-to-peer it... -peer learning is, is a big one now because people love to learn from each other and learning is very social. So if you want people to be motivated, it's something that they struggle with that others have experienced as well. And just, just allowing people to have conversations around that and that informal sort of semi-structured learning um, is definitely something that, that will engage learners more with, uh, with the content. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose Bernard was on the chat there as well. And it's something that like as consumers, even um, including learners, we've all become this self-serve. And Sheila has kind of linked it in as well to Bernard's question around the view of creating a culture for the growth mindset and self-directed learning culture. Um, has anyone got any tips of creating that kind of culture and mind shift change, I suppose, within the organization? Well, if, if, I'll jump in real quick. It starts with leadership. You know, I, I remember one of the I remember one of the first times I tried to bring learning into the workflow and I got yelled at by one of their managers because they saw it as a waste of time. OK, well, here we go. Right. I mean, when, when people are in the workflow, they're not motivated by us anymore. They're motivated by, as John said, the work, getting it done. And if you want a, 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 a self-reliant, courageous learner, they have to be allowed to be. Right. And so, so I think it's a marriage of two things to create the culture. Number one, the, the senior leadership has to buy into this and understand you know, what a learning culture is and what it takes. And sometimes it means you stop to learn. You're not always working, right? And secondly, you have to you have to create an environment that a learner can learn safely in and has one click, two sec, two clicks, we call it two clicks, 10 seconds, access to things that help them learn. If it's highly frustrating and takes 20 clicks and I have to look through 20 LMSs, and I'm not blaming LMSs, by the way, but we've made it too hard to find stuff. And so why would I do that and not just bother others or sit passively till someone tells me if, if we've not created a workflow domain and environment that makes 
self-learning easier. So management culture grows there, it trickles down, learner from the bottom up has to have an environment to do it safely and, and quickly. Yeah, I just think on that as well, like with the with the manager thing, like I think sometimes culture is, is just like the quality of the conversations that our people are having. And, you know, particularly what we want now with a learning culture is, is learning conversations. So whether that's informally or whether that's, I guess, like Ilse was saying there, with managers have an ability to have learning conversations with their with their employees. And it, whether that's from a career perspective or whether it's from, from, from a performance perspective, because ultimately, you know, the, the managers dictate the mood music and they dictate the culture as, as Bob was saying. So the more we can empower managers to even to have visibility on what employees are doing from a learning perspective, like we can have self-directed learning and they could be dipping in and out of assets, but to what extent are managers aware of what's happening from a learning perspective? And are they able to have those applied conversations, you know, in, in terms of Bob's five moments and needs, you know, the managers have to drive the apply and they have to give feedback on the apply as well. So getting them bought into it is important as well, you know, yeah, and I think from a sharing point of view, that's important as well, that there is like a, a culture is where you share what you've learned and where others add to that. Um, and, I, and I sometimes feel that learning and development organizations or teams are trying to control the way people learn a little bit too much. And I think instead they could encourage or put structures in place where people can learn from each other um, because that, 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 that happens naturally. And, and, and I think that would be very powerful trying to kind of relinquish a little bit of that control of ownership of learning because it sits with everybody. We should trust really our employees that they want to learn and they want to share their knowledge and, and we should be enablers uh, in that uh, in that conversation. And, and real quickly, there's a great comment in chat, guys. One thing, at least, we, at least in the States, one thing we do wrong, we do poorly for managers is we take really good performers and we make them managers of performers. That doesn't mean they're good managers. And, and right, and so and so management skills, although we have some classes on them and stuff, are really particularly in mentoring and coaching and creating the learning culture that my panelists have, my fellow panelists have described. These are skill sets to be learned, and I, and I think they're very open to it. But I think many managers are nervous about it, right? This is a soft skilly thing, right? So I think that the skills in coaching, what coaching means, right, and how and helping managers do be better at that helps create this learning culture better. And, but I think we have to step up and, and understand that that's a skill in. Yeah. Would you have any recommendations for a startup to adopt a growth mindset from day one and as um, as they are building their team? And I suppose this is really important onboarding of members, you know, staff members as well. So anybody want to take that one? I'll open up to the, the whole panel. John, you work a lot with companies in terms of that area, so I'm pleasant to you to start. Yeah, no, because I, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a startup myself to a certain extent in, in, in a small company. And it is, you know, I suppose with, with a startup, you're trying to build the culture from the ground up, you know, and, you know, it, it, part of me feels it would be good to get, get people back into the office with me here so I can start to connect with them and actually and actually build that culture. And I've had, I've had, I think I have three team members now that I've never met. Um, which, you know, and so it's been a real experience in terms of how you onboard them. And I think that that growth mindset thing, particularly for startups, they have to buy into the vision. They have to buy into what you're trying to achieve, you know, and, you know, because if, if they get motiva motivated around the, your, what, your, what your value is or what your mission is, then they'll naturally have a growth mindset. Like people will have growth mindsets if they're motivated around it, you know, if they're, like, like Pauline was saying there, if they're motivated to learn. So for a startup, I think it's just getting them to buy into, you know, that they're not just coming maybe to pick up a paycheck or whatever it might be. They're, you know, they're really coming to, I suppose, to help you deliver or go on the journey with you. So if you can get them to buy into that, I think you're halfway there in terms of growth mindset. You know, and, and I, I think, John, too much, you know, too much onboarding pivots on, you know, where's the restroom? How do I sign up for my benefits? And, 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 and hearing from every vice, pre vice president of the company what they do, right? You're talking about a whole different element and, and, and to your point, Linda, which is brilliant, is when, when you get new employees in, they are new employees. They have no baggage. They have no, they, they, you're telling them how it could work in those days. So build, I think John was brilliant in this, build those things into onboarding. You know, if you want a, a self-reliant culture, tell them there is one, enable it, build it into onboarding. Let them learn some things on their own in onboarding. You know, so, so that it's modeled and they learn right away that that is the culture. It's not one you have to, you have to retrofit after um, in, in how things are, are taught. 
so I, I walked yeah, through. no, no I, just, I was just going to add that it's that it's that I think the, the topic of psychological safety comes into that a little bit as well and that you have to create an environment where it's you know where it's safe to fail where um you know it's it's okay to get feedback um it's um that, that, that it's expected to, to try and to try things to experiment um all of those kind of uh, kind of skills that like that you need to to, to create like and have a dialogue about like wh what is it like to work here and what's okay what's not okay we'll be there to have your back i think investing in that and 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 really thinking about how you can improve that so teams can work more better together more collaboratively together i think investing in that is is is, is important too um and it kind of leads into it links into this question as well how are the teams and organization managing the skills and competencies for this new learning so as they're looking at their own internal staff but also as they're looking at maybe you know recruiting new members of their team what kind of skills and competencies are, are you seeing out there that organizations are, are looking for away from the kind of maybe technical side of, of the role self-efficacy is a big deal i mean you know the the i, I think i think your, your point about the self-serve culture is, is an interesting one you said earlier i think you know that's I think and there's, there's ways to to put that out there, and ask questions about that. You know, and, and is that because if you want if you want a self-enabled learner, uh, these are qualities that you need to, to see if you can recruit in versus have to teach, right? So I think finding out about their degree in which they um, feel comfortable standing self-reliant, that they are comfortable working from home and sometimes in isolation, you know, from their team. That, that they may have to meet virtually or otherwise, you kind of think. I think these are questions that are coming into interviews around the cultural side of this that you know we didn't ad address before. And of course, you know, you learn as much as you can in an interview, and you hope you hope you know a lot. But I, I think those are the kind of things we have to start bringing into those questions as well. And from from your um, what are you are you seeing? I suppose I'm sure you know you're both boarding new staff or hiring new people and on on the training side the theme that you're seeing right not just within Ireland but obviously you're a global organization um I guess you know we we, we were I think we are moving towards um more transferable skills you know um it, it's no longer you know about the, your current role and uh, and thinking of how you operate your role but actually how you're going to build your a mindset that is going to make you resilient and, and move towards your next opportunity um so yeah and, and it's also giving um also enough uh content enough technology or tools uh to to allow everyone to 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 build a community of learning and you know talking about how important the message that the leaders gave about learning and, and about you know the um the values that we we want to encourage uh, at primark is essential yeah, no, I, th I think I suppose I, from my perspective, I'm probably just looking at, you know, what are the kind of the, the emerging skills maybe that the, the modern kind of trainer needs to have. And I don't know, we've, we've kind of touched on a lot of that as well. But, you know, I, I think, you know, someone that's so, like someone that's willing to come into an organization and, you know, they, they're they're willing to kind of socialize their expertise, is, I think, is important as well. And that kind of whole kind of, you know, social peer-to-peer -peer side of it so someone that's quite open-minded and flex you know flexibility is a big thing as well so it is probably those transferable skills that that employers are looking for now and you know because you know even talking about subject matter experts there now like we're, we're probably asking more from them now from a learning perspective than we might have done in the past where we're expecting more maybe flexibility from them and the, obviously the conversations with them are changing as well so you probably want people coming into an organization that have that adaptability and that flexibility to to shift into different roles as opposed to maybe being I guess siloed in one particular area. Thanks, John. And I suppose transversal skills and um, 21st century skills as well is a big area of research that ourselves here at Learn and Rate have been working on for a number of years. And uh, I think the pandemic has really even, I suppose, shifted it right to the forefront of, of thinking and looking at well, what kind of key tools, what methodologies, how can we do this in a better way? And um, last question, because I'm and I can see the time flashing there. So many people will agree with you all today, but who's doing it well? Who's out there that we know is, is doing this at a really, or is there is there many organizations doing it really well? Bob? Yeah, you know, I, I've seen um, 
I, I'll throw out some brands if this helps that I've seen doing some remarkable stuff. IKEA International, right? Boeing, um, Bank of America, McKinsey. You know, these are these are some remarkable brands that are. And, and by the way, friends, this was pre-pandemic. I want to be awful careful about pinning everything on the pandemic. You know, it's it, it's 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 a it's a it's a um. A stim it stimulates this discussion, and I think it has, a, I put two words, opportunity and acceleration, I think are part of what's coming out of this. But I think these are things that L&D should have had and should have been talking about for a long time. So those organizations that have made the shift to realize that if in the, in the world we live in today and the rate of change, pandemic or otherwise, if we don't have a self-enabled, empowered workforce um, and, and, and everything has to come back to training, you're not going to be competitive. So, so we, I've seen some remarkable work in organizations like that. So I'd love to chat for more time, but unfortunately we are out of time. So I'd like to thank you, Bob, and our panelists today for very insightful topical discussions. And to you, the attendees, for such engagement and questions as well for us. And um, just to let you know, our next Link and Learn event will be in September, and that will be covering wellness and well-being. And of course, we are very busy here in the background working on Learnovation, which will be later in October. So if you'd like to know a little bit more about ourselves and what we're doing, please do reach out on info at learnovatecenter.org or membership at learnovatecenter.org. So thank you and have a wonderful day.